Thanks, guys. So with the one song that we were singing there, I mean, all of them, obviously, were great and very worshipful. But when we were singing, I think it's Overwhelmed, it just struck me with this week's passage. You know, he's talking about, what we're singing in there about just how overwhelmed we are by his presence, by his beauty Right? It's about this relationship, right? And just in our response to this relationship. And this week in James, we're looking at just how underwhelmed the church was, right? When he's, when he's talking to them. And when we look around ourselves, and even in context of this passage, evaluating our lives to seeing how, how underwhelmed we tend to be with this relationship, how, how little effect it can have on our lives, right? How how small of an impact it can make on us, right? But when we're truly overwhelmed by what God has done with us, overwhelmed by this relationship, man, the, the work, the things that it can do in our lives and in, in the world around us, right? But there, there needs to be this, this moment where we just get it, where we get what it is, where we understand this relationship, we understand Christianity. It's not just about okay, this is the Bible and I read this and, and if, I, if I pray the prayer, if I, if I call myself a Christian, it means that when I die, I get to go to heaven and I don't have to be in eternal torment, right? It's not, it's not even just a way, you know, to be a good person, right? This is, this is the way and, and it's something that involves our whole life. When we were talking earlier this year, I talked about Elisha and how when Elijah called Elisha, he... He burned all of his bridges. He was all in. He was so overwhelmed by the opportunity to, to be called, to be working with Elijah, right? That he gives up everything. And he doesn't just like go and like say goodbye to mom and dad and, and give away this old job and walk away. I mean, he slaughters the, the livestock that were pulling the plow, his job, right? And he builds an altar out of the wood that was the yokes for them. And he burns it and he sacrifices his old life and he gives it away so he has nothing to go back to. There's, there's no going back. Man, I'm all in, right? And we're reading this, this passage this week. It's just overwhelmingly underwhelmed. <laughs> They're not all in. They're, it's kind of like, ah, okay, cool, good. Now we're just going to keep going on with life as it is. And that, that so easily is the culture of Christian, North American Christianity especially, Right? The Christianity that we see. I go to church on Sunday, and then I go back and do whatever the rest of the week. And I put in my time, if it fits in my schedule. Right? And man, it is, it's about a relationship. It's, it's, it's all in. It's not just I dabble in Christianity. I, I dabble in the Bible from time to time. I dabble in talking to God. Right? Man, I am, I'm either all in or I'm all out. I can't be sitting on the fence. Right? In, in Revelation, God said... Man, you're lukewarm. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. You're, you're in or you're out, right? And so this week in James, it's, it's, a, li it's a little bit of a tough text, right? It's, it's going to be convicting. It was convicting studying it and reading it and even just looking back at my life. I've been like, man, there were, this is me. This at times is still me, right? Um, but man, God loves us so much that he gives us the message in Scripture to convict us so that we would change, right? So that, we would, so that we would be all in, right? So this week, I'm going to be reading from James 4, 13 through 5, 11. It's kind of a big section, but it all flows together, and it all flows out of what we were talking about last week, whether it's worldly wisdom or godly wisdom, right? The result of worldly wisdom is we live like the world. Even in the church, we can be affected by worldly wisdom, and our, and our goals and our aspirations can be worldly. If they're truly godly, they're going to be different, Right? And that's going to affect us. And we want that to be who we are. Right? To start as our foundation. You know, what it is is a relationship with God. 
what the whole, who is God is even a great question, right? Because there's a lot of other religions out there that are even close to Christianity, right? That, that might, through worldly works, try to steal us away from the church, try to steal us away from the truth of the gospel, right? The truth of the gospel starts in creation that God always existed. God was not a man who became a God, right? God it was not a God among gods, God is eternally existent, completely in control. He created everything. Everyone comes from him. He is the source. He's the source of life, right? And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, none of them are created. Eternally existed as God, as one, right? As a plural one, which is hard to understand, but it's the truth, (laughs) right? In his amazing beauty, He created all of creation to be in relationship with him. He created each of us individuals, humanity, in his likeness for relationship with him. He created man and woman in his likeness. Together, we resemble him because we are relational, right? And we had this great opportunity to be in perfect relationship with him and everything. But we chose worldly wisdom rather than intimacy, we still we wanted more and something else. We wanted to be godlike, right? And so they, they ate the fruit that doesn't bear seed, right? That that brings death, right? And so because of that, that broke our eternal intimacy with God, right? Then there had to be death, and it broke our our relationship with each other. All of creation we see is marred by this. But even in the midst of, of bringing about the curses, explaining what the ramifications were for breaking intimacy with him, he provided a way and he said, I'm going to fix it. You broke it, I'm going to fix it. And so then we see all throughout the text leading up to Jesus, right? The God-man, the second person in the Trinity, the Son, came down and put on flesh and became Jesus. And he lived the perfect life we should live and died the death we deserve to die so that we could have a relationship with him. And then he rose again and went back to the Father and reigns over his kingdom already, right? His kingdom is is here and not yet. The church, we're pockets of the kingdom, and it is our job to be all in. We get to be all in and have a relationship with him and be part of saving other people out of the world. We get to be part of infecting worldly wisdom with godly wisdom and stealing people away. And Jesus even told us Before he arose, he said, man, the gates of hell don't stand a chance. They're on defense. Y'all are on offense. Go get them. They can't stand up to you. They're done. I paid the price. You got the power. But you got to abide in me. Right? And then we have this eternal hope of, man, he's coming back. And he could come back at any moment. Literally, he could come back tonight. What do you want to be doing when he comes back? Do you know what I'm saying? Do we want to be... Do I want to be watching Netflix when the creator and my savior comes back? Do I want to be planning out what I'm going to do next week, planning out what I'm going to do next year, where I'm going to live when he comes back? Or do I want to be having conversations? Do I want to be part of doing his work in this world? Right? It doesn't mean we don't plan. It doesn't mean that we don't don't have a job, we don't work. But even our job is part of this eternal work. Right? That is a place where we get to go and infect the world with God and his wisdom, right? That's where he's called us to be a missionary. So when we're figuring this stuff out, when we're planning, we need to consult God because it's his mission, not our mission. So let's get into the text because <laughs> this is what it is. And man, he's coming back. When he comes back, it's going to be a beautiful new creation and we're not going to have to worry about stumbling anymore. We're not going to have to worry about people leading us astray. We're not going to have to worry about anything. Just intimacy with our Father and each other and even the animals. <laughs> no more death, just beauty. Let me pray for us before I open this up. Lord, man, thank you for your beauty. Thank you for loving us when we didn't deserve it. We have all jacked this up. We're born into this, Lord. We don't even know better. And sometimes even in our striving to to figure it out, we make it worse. We need you so desperately, Father. We need you just to understand your word, to to interpret it correctly. And we we need you in order to actually apply it to our lives. Don't let this just be new knowledge for us that we keep upstairs. 
Help us hit the pavement with this. Lead, the, lead this new message and, and knowledge of you and intimacy with you into every conversation we have. Lord, I pray that we would just be a slave to you, as it says in Romans 6, that we just wouldn't be able to help ourselves but tell people about you. Make a difference in your name, Lord Jesus. Be with us tonight, Lord. Lead us and guide us. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. 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 I love you too, buddy. <laughs> All right, we're in James 4, 13 through 5, 11. And I'm breaking it into three sections, right? In 4, 13 through 17, it talks about worldly wisdom leads to worldly preparations. What you strive for is what you die for. 5, 1 through 6, rebuke against living according to your own will and effects of worldly wisdom even inside the church. And then in 5, 7 through 11, we're going to talk about how to work according to God's will, patiently cultivating while loving and abiding. Right? I broke this up into preparation. Right? This is this first section. What are you preparing for? Right? And so let me just read this text here. It says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like a vapor that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So it is sin to know the good and yet not do it. Man, so in this, in this section, he's talking about them making preparations, right? And nowhere in there does God appear. They're focused on going and making money, going and, man, what's my career going to be? What am I going to do? Where am I going to live? Their focus is here, right? What's, what's my place? What am I going to do, right? And how am I going to survive? That's their number one focus. Nowhere in there does it say, like, man, what has God called me to do? What would God have me to do? And even, what am I doing right now? Right? It's, it's, they're looking at the horizon. They're being good businessmen, maybe even good adults. They're adulting well, right? <laughs> As our world would tell us, right? They're operating in worldly wisdom. It's a smart thing to plan. And even... For them to have planned and said, what, I'm going to go here and do business and make a profit, they've done some research, right? They're not just willy-nilly, okay, I'm going like, to make this and do this. It's not like, man, they've looked into what's the demographics like, you know, what is the business opportunity here, what careers are open, what's the cost of living, right? The worldly wisdom, a lot of people, even in the church, would tell you, man, this is the kind of stuff that you need to adult well, right? Even like, man, I'm in college, What's my career going to be? What are my talents and stuff, and how can I use that? What's my major going to be, right? God needs to be involved in those plans. Otherwise, it's evil. It might be wise, but it's evil, right, to not consider what God would have you do, right, to not consider, man, how is God going to use me? Now, it's not to say, to have any kind of plan is an evil thing, right? You should also be wise and like, what, all right, what, pray about it, first of all. Talk to other people. Look at, okay, I'm not just going to, or I'm going to go and be a missionary in Spain and I don't even know Spanish or I don't have any training, right? Like, y you need to plan, right? It's good to make preparations. He doesn't say don't plan, just throw it all up and just kind of go and it'll work itself out, right? But man, in here, their focus is I'm going to go and I'm going to do this and I'm going to make a profit and I'm going to have mine, right? I'm going to put together my 401k. I'm going to have my money. At some point, I'm going to be able to retire and look at all my stuff and it's going to be good and I'm going to rest. And man, if that's what you did, you could get to the end and it could, be, it could look like success. It could feel like success and it could be completely meaningless and even evil, right? Are you going to sit on your deathbed and be like, man, this empire that I've built is great, I might even give them some money to the poor and stuff. But man, what impact did you make for the kingdom? Right? What's your relationship and intimacy look like with God? 
Does it require you having a good 401k? Does it require you having a lot of money? Right? You could actually be very wise in the church and you might not have all of those things and you're still, you have abided well, you have done well, right? And, and that ultimately is storing up riches in heaven instead of riches on earth, right? In Proverbs 16, 9, it says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps, right? And so even looking in this context here, man, their hearts are what leading them, and their actions and their plans and their desires are revealing where their hearts are. You know, we've already talked about um, works versus faith. You know what I mean? Faith without works is dead, right? And then we talked about words, right? And words also reveal our heart. And then we talked about wisdom. And then now, it's, it's funny, we kind of worked down to wisdom being the, the kind of center and focus, right? And now we're seeing how wisdom is leading, right? Man, if... If my desires and stuff are out here and God is not involved in them, then, man, it's really revealing that I might still be dead, right? Or I might just be struggling. I might be off, right? But, man, if I am totally overwhelmed by God, I will give it all up for him, and my focus is going to be the kingdom, and the, his kingdom instead of my kingdom, right? And ultimately, he's in control. So I could, I could plan all these things, and I might not make it past tomorrow, so if all of my focus is out here and I don't make it past tomorrow, man, I got nothing done. I got nothing to show for it. But if all of my focus is past out here, it's to eternity, like she was saying, <laughs> right? Then, man, then, then eternity is going to affect every single day, right? I might, I might have some plans out here for how I could serve God, how I could do things, how I could serve God as me, how he has individually gifted me, right? I matter. It's not that I don't matter. I matter. He gave me my passions and talents and desires, right? So I complain about how I'll do them, and I'll say, man, God, if you will me to go here, cool, I'll do that, and I'll make, you know, I'll put in the resume, I'll, I'll you know what I mean, I'll do this kind of stuff, and, and I'm still also thinking about eternity, so still today, I'm like, okay, well, I put that in, and, you know, and I showed up at Bible study, and, and we, we talked about this, and I shared some convicting things, whatever, that I've been struggling through, and I ran into this person at Dunkin' Donuts, and so I shared my faith and invited them to church. That happened. Good job, Ryan. <laughs> right? Um, and, you know what I mean? Like, and, oh, I see this person broken down on the side of the road, so I know that I'm on the way to Bible study, but I'm going to stop and help this purpose person first. Right? Shoot, that happened in Acts. Peter and John were on their way to a prayer meeting, which is very important, and they stopped and healed a dude. And guess what? Thousands of people came to faith. <laughs> right? So being, making plans, making preparations, but always being kingdom and eternity-minded and being interruptible for him. So an example I had on the positive side of this, because I didn't just want to be in the negative with, like, don't make plans, <laughs> right? You know, the, the positive is, is to make those plans with God in, in mind, with his kingdom purposes in mind. How can I serve you today, and how can I serve you 20 years from now? So what do I got to do between now and then to get there? Right? But my purpose, ultimately, is how do I serve you, God, not how do I serve me? Right? Um, Paul, when he was going about doing his missionary work, in, in Acts 16, if you want to turn with me, I'll try to speak slowly before we get there. Acts 16, 6 through, through 10. We have an example of Paul going out to do ministry. Right? And Paul is not just willy-nilly kind of like, oh, show up here, do this, okay, cool. Like, he's making plans. He's trying to do things. Right? But he's doing them in submission to God. So let's read. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. They had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they came to Myasia, Myasia <laughs> they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So Paul had made intentions. I'm going to go here. Here's some great cities in the area so I can go and I can have influence and I can preach, preach the gospel to them. And it doesn't tell you exactly how it happens, but it says the Spirit didn't let them talk. Did Paul go mute? I don't know. Or did he just not have an opportunity to speak? 
we don't know, but you see him making a plan and then him following the spirit. And the spirit said, now you're not talking here. So he's like, all right, that didn't work. I'm going to go here then. Again, he makes a plan and he goes and he's trying to be obedient and do what God has called him to do. And it doesn't work out again. The spirit of Jesus didn't let him talk there. Whatever that means, right? You know, that might be that, that he had a vision and God said, no, you're not going here. This is not where I've called you to be. It could be he didn't have an opportunity to go there, right? And then finally, Paul has a vision. And God's like, Paul, through a vision of a Macedonian man, come here, come to us. We would have you. Come preach the gospel to us. And so they're like, all right, we planned here, it didn't work. We planned here, it didn't work. But we didn't give up. We were relentless. We kept working and we waited until God called us to the right place, right? And they didn't just wait complacently, right? They were waiting actively, trying to do things, trying to build his church. And then he shows up and he calls them. And they're like, okay, cool, let's go. And they went, right? And then he does a lot of ministry all throughout Macedonia. And it's great, and it's hard, and it's good, and it's fruitful, right? And Paul's life is given over to the gospel. He gives his life to the gospel. He plans to go in different places, and he uses his, his talents and his passions to do God's work, right? But his ultimate planning is always God-centered, is always kingdom-centered, and God leads him. In Ephesians 5, 15 through 20, we have, that's kind of like the example, and, and this would be the, the teaching on this, right? And so this is before our normal marriage text, which I just preached a couple weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> so here it says, pay careful attention then to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. Making the most of the time. We don't know when he's coming. The days are evil, right? We live in this evil world, right? And even time, it's passing quickly. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And so basically what Paul is saying there is, be wise and intentional, but that's not enough. You need to be filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit. He doesn't say, just be filled with the Spirit and it's going to work out, right? You also need to be wise and intentional, right? And so you need the both. And how do we be wise and intentional? Man, partly we need to know His Word. We need to be abiding in Him daily. It even says that they're, they're singing songs, they're worshiping together. Right? And so that, that's stirring their affections for their creator. They're not just sitting here and, okay, I'm going to do this eventually. I mean, they're actively worshiping daily. And that's leading their lives. We don't do it just by, on our own, right? Just by reading the word daily. We read the word, but we also need to be intimate with him and intimate with each other in scripture, in worship. <laughs> right? And that is how we're going to live this out. We're planning and we're actively living and abiding daily as we get there. And our plans are for him and for his purposes with the knowledge that he could come back at any moment, with the desire that he come back at every moment. I remember when I was a kid, before being married, I won't give too much of an example, but man, I'm like, I hope Jesus waits till after I can get married to come back. There was something I had in mind, right? And so it was like, man, just wait till I get married. Then it'll all be good. Right? Man, there is nothing that would steal our joy if Jesus came back before we had it. Right? He's our greatest joy. That's where we're going to find fulfillment. That's where we're going to find joy. We should be desiring that he comes back. It says in the end of Revelation, that's like the closing. It's like, come, Lord Jesus. It's a plead. Please. I was having a conversation with someone this week, and we were talking about just how hard life is, how depressing it can be at times, how hard even in the church it is sometimes to fit in. And it's just, man, I just want Jesus to come back, right? And that's okay. That's not giving up, right? That's our desire. Because, yeah, even in church, we're broken, and we're going to hurt each other without even meaning to, right? And so, man, our ultimate desire is, yes, Lord, man, could you come back tonight? Lead me today. Help me to, help me to worship you well today. Help me to lead other people and show you to the world today. But, man, come back today, please, and then you make it through today, all right. Tomorrow, would you come back tomorrow, Lord? 
right? And, and daily, that's our desire of like, help me abide in you and please come back. Man, I don't want to live forever in this world. I want to live forever with you. This world is a constant reminder of our break in relationship with you. There's nothing greater than that relationship. I'm overwhelmed. Right, man, I, I, I urge us to sing that again at the end. That's just such a great song. That, that's, that is our worship of him. Man, let me be overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, which leads us into 5, 1 through 6, which, which talks about perspective, right? And it's really, it's, it's perspective leading to action. It's their, their wrong perspective that's leading them at this point. They're, they're operating out of this worldly wisdom. They're making their plans, and then they're acting in their plans. They're striving in those plans. So it says, come now, you rich people. And remember, he's talking to the church. This letter is to the church. So he doesn't take a break and be like, let me talk to the non-believers, right? He's like, hey, church, <laughs> come now, you rich people. Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming for you. Ouch. Right? And it's not just, we think of rich as being like the 1%. Everyone in this room owns shoes. We are the rich in the world. Right? We, we have. We don't have to worry about food. We don't have to worry about shelter. Right? We're rich. Your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Wow. <laughs> that's, man, that's tough. And, and again, we're coming... Let me just go on and then we'll get back to it. Right? Look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cries out, and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous who does not resist you. Man, and so... Right, we're coming out of, here's your planning, you're making your plannings and your preparations to become rich. And oftentimes, especially those who don't abide with God, he'll, he'll give us over to our riches. Right, in, in Exodus 33, God was mad at Israel. Right, he had brought them out, saved them from Egypt, and he gives them the law. And in the midst of giving them the law, they're down there making a calf. They're already committing adultery against their Savior who saved them and loves them, right? And so God's like, you know what, Moses? I'm just going to send you guys. I'm going to go ahead and give you the land. I'm going to give you the land. Let them have the land. They want the land. And I'm going to send you off without me. So he's like, I'll give you what you want, and you don't even, like, and I won't abide with you, and you don't have to worry about me. You don't have to worry about following the laws and stuff. I'll give you what you want, right? And Okay, fine. Moses is like, no. No, what we, what we want and need is you. What we want and need is intimacy with you. Don't send us off without you. The land is not the prize. You're the prize. Right? And so, you know, looking at this, man, they're, they're making their plans and preparations for the land, for the blessing, to be blessed without the intimacy. They're missing out on the good stuff, the relationship with God that makes that all that worth it. And they're looking at the, the temporal land, the temporal riches, the ones that are going away. And they get it. He gives them over to it. Man, if that's really going to be the center of your heart, that's your focus, man, God might let you become one of the 1%. You might become rich, filthy rich, at the expense of others. But you're not going to find fulfillment there. It's not going to please you. Look at all the rich people who commit suicide or drink themselves into a stupor, self-medicate, because they're still not happy. They got everything they wanted, and they're still empty on the inside. And here he's saying, man, those treasures, not only are they not going to bring you fulfillment, but all you're doing is heaping up evidence against yourself. And the day of judgment, he's going to come back and be like, so what were you doing? Right? These are the end days. Well, I was, I made a lot of money. <laughs> right? And he's, so, so where are the poor that you're supposed to be serving? So where are the disciples you're supposed to be making? Right? And so all of that which they've attained, they really have just heaped up evidence against themselves. And by they, I, it could be we, 
right? If our focus is just me, what am I going to do? What makes me important, right? How am I going to survive? I want the next biggest and better thing. Uh, if I get that, I'm just heaping up evidence against myself that, that I don't have this intimate relationship with him, that my focus is still worldly. And then I'm looking at this text here, and you get to this part where it says, look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cries out. And it's like, so is he only talking to farmers? Right, like, it was bringing up questions for me, you know, so, so if, if that's the case, then if you're not a farmer, don't worry about it. <laughs> or if you're not a businessman, don't worry about it. If you don't have any employees or anybody, that, like, right? I think it's deeper than that, right? Because he uses a lot of, throughout all of Scripture, they use examples and metaphors, right? And so looking at Luke 10, 1 through 12, this brought me to Jesus' words. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself was to go. And so he's talking, he's sending out 70 disciples to go out and preach and make disciples and prepare the way for him to come and do ministry, right? And he says, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't carry a money bag, traveling bag, or sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this household. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they offer, for the worker is worthy of his wages. Don't move from house to house. When you enter any town and they welcome you, eat the things set before you. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. When you enter any town and they don't welcome you, go out into its streets and say, we are wiping off even the dust of your town that clings to our feet as a witness against you. Know this for certain, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. This text seems to parallel what James is saying here. Man, you rich, you're even in the church, your focus was to go out and make money, right? Your focus was yourself instead of the kingdom. And not only were you committing a sin of omission, you weren't going out and actively doing the work of, of discipleship, of spreading the gospel. But man, you were, you who were in the church were not taking care of those who were called to go out and do that, right? This is a, a group thing, right? When they went out to the different cities and stuff, they would preach the gospel there. They would do the work of building churches there, Right? And if the, if the town wasn't caring for them, he's like, you know what? Your ability to raise funding doesn't qualify you as a minister of the Lord. I qualify you. Their ability to support you qualifies them as a town that's ready to receive the gospel. Right? And so he's like, man, if they won't receive you, if they won't care for you, move on. That's not where I've called you to plant a church. Right? Move on. That's not the ministry I've called you to. Right? And so he's saying, man, you church who didn't support them, man, you've actually withheld wages from the people that I've sent to actually minister to you. And so you made yourself rich, and you, you stopped doing my work, and you even stopped me from doing work in that area through you. We can't stop God. God's in control. He's going to win. Right? And so that's, that's what I feel like James is saying there. And then we move on to this last section, which talks about perseverance. Right? So we, first of all, you know, we talked about the idea that, man, out of their, their worldly wisdom, their desire is just for themselves. Then we see how that plays out, right? Their perspective leads them to action. Their perspective is just, man, I'm all out for me. And then what I get is I just, I heap judgment on myself, right? And they're missing out on opportunities to minister to the people around them and do the work themselves, Right? And they're stopping others who are doing that work from doing the work in their area. And then this last section, we see the do. This is how you do it, right? And so it's with perseverance and patience. So here he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, therefore, in light of all that that I've just told you, in light of that that I've been, been teaching you, in light of seeing 
this is what they were desiring to do, and this is what the results would be if Jesus came back when they were still doing that, right? Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. It's going to take some time. We can desire that he comes now, but we have to be patient because, and persevere it because we don't know when he's coming. It, it could be a day from now, an hour from now. It could be a thousand years from now, right? See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. Man, the farmer goes out and he has to cultivate the dirt. He has to till it up. And then when it's right time, he puts the seed in, right? And then he, then he waits. It doesn't just shoot up the next day. And some of the seed doesn't take. And some of the seed takes and does well, right? And then even when it's doing well, it's not quite time to harvest it yet. You have to sit and watch, and there's a right time that it's, it's, it's at its peak that you can go out and harvest it. So it takes perseverance and patience. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Man, stay strong, stay firm. How do we do that? By abiding, by daily pleading with God to help us get through today to help us to understand him today, to help us respond well to people today. Whew. Patience is needed in the daily struggle. It's real. And he says, brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Man, even in this perseverance, we might be like, man, I'm working so hard and they're not doing anything. Or, or I'm giving to this and stuff, but they're not giving anything. And he's saying like, man... Worry about abiding in me. Worry about what I've called you to do. You do you, right? And I'll work on them. And he says, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. And immediately I'm reading that. I had been reading through Jeremiah a couple weeks ago. Man. My takeaway from Jeremiah Again, patience and suffering. Dude was patient, and he suffered a lot. I mean, he suffered just in, in, in things actively happening to him and things actively not happening, right? His, his life sucked from world standards. God calls Jeremiah, you're going to be my mouthpiece. You're going to speak on behalf of Yahweh. That is awesome. We think about that, and it's like, wow, <laughs> That's amazing. Now, that's a job. I want that job. By the way, Jeremiah, no one's going to respond. Your church is going to suck. <laughs> I'm going to call you to call my people back to intimate relationship with me. Tell them how much I love them, how much my heart is breaking because they are breaking, they're committing adultery with me, right, with other gods. And they're not going to respond, Jeremiah. They're going to be driven into exile. Right? So success for Jeremiah was obedience. Obedience, even though it looked like he was doing a bad job. I'm, I'm, I'm going, and I'm preaching, and I'm telling them, and I'm doing all these, I'm showing them all these examples, right? Visuals, right? I'm walking around naked for two years. I'm sure he had like loincloth or something on. Right? I'm cooking my food over dung, and I'm like, dude, I'm doing all this ridiculous stuff, and they still don't get it. They think I'm crazy, right? But I'm doing it, <laughs> and okay, I'm abiding, but man, I'm sure that there's days he's just like, what am I even here for? Why do I bother? They're just going to be exiled anyways. Does my life even matter? Man, maybe if I just soften the blow a little bit, because Lord, if I tell them exactly, like, they might all leave, <laughs> right? Like, Man, and he does it, and he perseveres. And he just does exactly what God tells him to do, and it happens like he tells him to happen. And, man, there's even a point where God's like, tell you what, tell them if, if they'll just surrender to the Babylonians. They can leave the city, and I won't destroy it. I'll just take them off into exile. If they'll just take the spanking, right, it'll be, it'll be good. And they can still have, the city will still be there. My temple will still be there. But if they won't go out and surrender, if they won't submit, if they won't humble themselves and just take the punishment that I've told them is coming, man, I'm going to level it. And they, even at that point, he gives them a chance and like, nope. So he levels it. And some of them go off to Egypt, right? There's a remnant who escapes. And so then again, as it's called, like, man, don't stay here. Go back. God says go back and he's going to bless you and whatever. Nope. Guess what? Man, boom, banked again. They still won't respond. They still won't listen. Poor Jeremiah. Got to be so frustrated. 
If you would just listen, things would go well. God even wants to bless you physically right now. If you would just obey. If you would just abide. Right? And they don't listen. Right? But success is not how big the church you build. Success is not how much money you make. It's not how many people you lead to Christ even, right? It's the obedience, the fact that you'll go, the fact that you open your mouth, the fact that you abide in him and ask him where he wants you to go. That is success. Obedience. Not worldly standards. Not adulting well. (laughs) Like, there can be some good adulting in there, right? But abiding well. That is success. That's what he calls us to do. And that's where we're going to find joy. It's for our ultimate joy. We're actually going to be happier if we just obey. And then the other example he gave us was Job. I think I stopped at 10. (laughs) See, we, we count as blessed those who have endured. We count as blessed those who have endured. Those who have endured well. Those who finished well. Those who persevered. Those who didn't give up who kept on keeping on. You have heard of Job's endurance, and you have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Man, let me tell you about Job. God just, James just said that, man, Job is an example of God's compassionness and mercifulness, right? Job started out as someone who feared God, right? He was, he was a righteous man, Right? He's offering up sacrifices on behalf of his kids just in case they sinned, right? And so there's, there's also a picture of here of him of kind of like fearing God, but maybe not fully being intimate with God, right? It was more out of a sense of fear. But there's, out of no mistake of his own, right, out of no active sin that was causing some kind of punishment, God gives opportunity for Satan to go and, and start oppressing Job, right? So Satan shows up, and through Satan... Enemy t- enemies come in and, and ransack part of what he owns and kill off people. Um, nature, this windstorm comes in and kills his kids, right? It, it knocks down the house that they're all partying in and kills them. Everything's taken away. And then Satan's like, yeah, he's still worshiping you, though, because you haven't taken his health. So God's like, okay, take his health, too, right? So he's boils, he's scraping himself. Dude has been humbled to the point that his wife is even like, honey, just, just curse God and die. Like, just give up. Like, really, like... This is pitiful. This is, this is rough, right? And I've oftentimes have been maybe a little bit too hard on the wife, right, from, from my own perspective. You know, it could have been even a sense of endearment of like, man, I love you, and I hate seeing you suffer like this. Just, just give up, right? But, but he doesn't even give up then. He continues to fight. He continues to struggle, right? He perseveres, even though his circumstances are terrible. He continues on, Right? Then even his close friends come and say, man, you must have deserved this. Right? They wrongfully accuse him of sinning just because of his circumstances, not through knowing Job or understanding what's going on in his life. Right? And still, Job doesn't sin. He does get to a point in conversation with God where he's like, man, what gives? Right? And then God has to correct him and says, like, where were you when I formed the earth? Where were you when I made all these plans? I'm God. You're my creation. Who are you to question me? And then Job's like, okay, you know, you're right. (laughs) I'm just going to shut up. Nope, nope. Have a conversation with me, right? But you need to really know me. And so then he has this conversation by the the end in 42 of Job, chapter 42. Finally, Job's like, you know what? I knew of you, but now I know you, right? And how? Through persevering through all this suffering, for continuing to try to abide, right? Right? by not keeping his eyes off God, by not giving up and cursing him and just giving in to worldly wisdom. Man, the circumstances suck. I guess I should just give up. This this isn't really worth it. Maybe I'll try something else. He perseveres through all of that, right? And then he grows in his intimacy and his affections for God. And then as a result, God then uses Job to atone for the sins of his friends. God tells his friends, hey, you who who wrongfully accused this righteous man, you're going to need to give sacrifices to Job, and he's going to offer them on behalf of you. You can't even offer them to me. He's going to do it for you. And because he endured, he's able to do that for you. Right? And then in the end, everything is restored to Job. Everything is made new. 
right? And this also Old Testament story of Job gives us a picture, a type of Christ, right? There's a righteous man who had done nothing wrong to deserve it and suffers, right? And the result of his suffering in the end is that he can atone for the sins of of others, right? And then in the end, all things are made new. All things are restored to him, right? And so it gives us a type, a picture of what Christ is coming to do in the New Testament, right? But it took enduring. And Jesus even did that in his life, right? He endured. He was born to a woman out of wedlock, right? And then he grew up amongst sinful people. And then when, he, when, when the power of the Spirit comes upon him, he starts his ministry. He starts helping people, serving people, loving people, doing miraculous things in front of them, preaching the gospel to them, offering relationship with them. They reject him and they, they curse him and they hurt him. Ultimately, they kill him. But then he rises again and he's able to pay for their sins, atone for them, and make all things new, which we see is, is coming because of what he did. He endured right? It wasn't a momentary thing. He didn't just show up one day and be like, all right, cool, did it, you're good, I'm gone. Man, it took time. He had to persevere for a lifetime, just like God's calling us to do. A lifetime, not just a week, not just a little bit of time, right? And so then I have this text, which Johnny has always been talking to me about for ministry, but also... um, is good for every believer, right? And 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm going to read 12 through, I finish. The main verse there is 14. (laughs) So it says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle, Comfort the discouraged, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good for one another and for all. And he goes on, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle a spirit, don't despise prophecies, but test all things, hold on to what is good, stay away from every evil, every kind of evil. Man, but my main point in there is, man, again, he's saying, persevere, be patient. It's going to take time. You're going to have to be patient just in waiting. You're going to have to be patient with people. It's going to be tough, right? And remembering back to Ephesians, you need to be led by the Spirit to do that. You, in your own strength, you're not going to be able to be patient and endure through this. It's going to be hard. But you can with God. You can with the Holy Spirit, Right? And so I said this a couple weeks ago, and so this is, again, I'm seeing this in James, right? The people are the church's greatest asset and the greatest liability. How we live out our faith proclaims the gospel to the world that we find ourselves in. So man, when we're not abiding, we're giving a false picture of the gospel to people, right? And we're hurting. We actually end up being part of the world that hurts people in Christ's name. And on the other side, man, if we would just abide, if we would just be all in and not worry about what's going to happen, right? Just be all in, knowing that he's going to come, he's going to take care of all things. Man, the difference that we can make. And what joy to be able to be part of that, right? When we get to heaven, we're going to be, dude, I don't even know what it's going to look like. (laughs) I don't know if it'll be like a sanctuary. We're just like having an open field kind of thing, but Man, the nations are going to be singing in all their different languages and stuff. We're just going to be worshiping him, and it's going to be epic. It's going to be awesome. Man, before then, imagine, you know, imagine a couple years from now, if we're abiding, we're seeking God's will, we're building. Imagine being in a room in our church that's filled with 100 people, 200 people, just worshiping God all, all out, all in. Right? We get to be part of that. We could be part of helping build that. Not building it for our sake, not building it to be like, I want to be famous, I want to be, you know, a worship minister on YouTube, or I want to be a minister on wherever, right? But man, we get to be part of seeing lives transformed. People having real purpose and vision. Right? 
people, thinking eternity, right? So not YOLO, but you only live forever, right? Living daily in light of forever. So let me pray for you, and then let's worship. Let's worship like it matters. You can do whatever your set is. We can go back to over. I don't even care. But man, let's just be all in and, and worship. We get to be here today because of what he's done for us. We get to be here today because he cares about us. And who knows what tomorrow will bring. But it's, it could be great. <laughs> Lord, thank you. <sighs> thank you for loving us. Thank you for, for man, that you're patient. <laughs> Help us to be more patient. Help us to endure. This life is hard, Father. <laughs> and you understand that. You lived through it. Shoot, even before then, you've endured the, your people, your creation, your people who you've loved, who you expressed that love to, rejecting you and going other places for affection instead of to you. Lord, we repent of that. We ask you to help us to change. Lord, continue daily to show us the ways in which we, we're still living like the world and we're still desiring that which the world offers instead of you. Help us to abide well, Father. And I pray for, for those who, we, who are trying to minister to, Lord. It is so hard, and at times I think that we, we think it's up to us. <laughs> it, we can feel like a failure when people fall away or when people don't listen. And I just pray that you'd help us to persevere there and be patient and continue to love well. And I pray that in times when we're burned or in times when things go wrong, that we wouldn't just give up because it would be easier not to care. Help us just to continue to love more each day, Father. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen.